So once again, we enter the stem cyclone. This is a, uh, uh, the more recent edition of the stem psychrometer. There's a, there's a few samples of them running around here, and I'm sure you will we'll probably get to play with them a little bit later. Um, and this is it applied to the, uh, uh, to the pepper. This is, this is a, uh, a graph or a, a figure from the first, from the paper that Mel Tyree and I put into plant cell and environment back in the early 80s, describing the instrument. And, and uh, this was the, uh, the pro I still have this prototype, found it in the drawer the other day, made it out of a stainless steel bolt, but it has, the, the business end of it is this little window, which is a tiny cell or a, a tiny um, chamber that is exposed to the water conducting tissue of the sample. In this end, in this case, we've got it exposed to the end of a sample that is encased in a large uh, Schollander style pressure bomb. And by manipulating the gas pressure in here, you can manipulate the water status at, at this. So it's a very unique um, variation on two independently, physically independent techniques, measuring the water status of exactly the same tissue. And uh, the resulting here is oh I, I should I should probably point out that you notice the two thermocouples here. This is the one that makes the vapor pressure measurement or the, uh, the wet bulb depression in the psychrometric uh, context. And this guy here reaches out and touches the sample. And when you measure the differential temperature between these two, you identify, it. see, the psychrometric method requires or assumes that everything here is at the same temperature. It almost never is. It's always a little bit out because here's a hunk of, in this case, stainless steel, or in that case, uh, chrome-plated brass, and here's a bit of uh, water and cellulose. And the energy balance and, and uh, capacitances of those two systems are extremely different. The heat capacity is extremely different. So the transfer coefficients, et cetera. I'm sure you could do an awful lot of, system, of, of sophisticated uh, arithmetic to figure out what's going on there. But the empirical evidence is always the stuff that I go for. So I reached out and measured the sample surface temperature directly uh, and then correct for it at roughly 80 bars or 8 megapascals per degree. It's a very significant source of, of, uh, of error. And so when you don't correct for it, here's the relationship between the, uh, the psychrometer measurement, or in this case we call it the hygrometer. Uh, it's a different instrument when you call it that, nevertheless. And here's the, uh, the, the pressure chamber, and, and you can see very lovely linear relationships, but the intercept is effectively an error. So when you correct for the temperature, everybody's happy. And I'm going to refresh your memory if I have to, <laughs> about the very, Alec insisted on this, uh, the, the fundamentals of, of plant water potential, total water potential, so you've got turgor pressure, osmotic potential, matrix, that, trust me, that's a tau, and gravity. And typically, in, in most situations, turgor pressure uh, and the corresponding osmotic potential in the symplast or the membrane bound tissue of the plant uh, dominates the water potential. Gravity plays a role, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, matrix, the matrix component is very difficult to independently quantify. It's usually bogged into the osmotic potential and the, I've never yet seen a really well stated <laughs> definition of matrix potential. So if anybody's got one, uh, you're welcome to interject. But uh, turgor pressure is, is a major piece here. Osmotic potential though is, is, the, uh, is the one that changes all the time. So here are the applications we've, we've uh, and somebody's gonna watch the time, I guess we're okay so far. Uh, here's by, f by no means an exhaustive list. I just rem remembered one that we didn't put in the field crops, which is potato. Um, but, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's just as busy as this slide was allowed to get. But uh, we've, we've got you folks here under extreme environment. And uh, trust me, coming from uh, 10 to below in Toronto uh, last week to this, uh, is an extreme environment for my poor, struggling Canadian physiology. Uh, 
This is a project that is ongoing in collaboration with ICT and an, and an Ontario nursery firm uh, that, that's looking at the application of uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi as a means of uh, symbiotically mitigating drought stress and nutrient stress in a, in a variety of, new, of uh, nursery tree species. And uh, I've got some data for that if we have a chance. These green, I started on cut roses and had a lot of support from the rose industry. And one of my, one of my bylines was uh, that I want to grow a rose on the moon. We even named it and bred it. it was, it's called uh, um, lunatic. It's a white rose. Anyway, someday. Uh, but we've also got some data from a few of these. Uh, there's, there's also a lot of publications with corn, the tomato, uh, the uh, eastern white cedar. So there's, there's quite a bit of work in, in, the, uh, in the literature already. Uh, here's the, the gravity issue. This is from uh, George Cope, who's at, in Arizona. And uh, George is involved with a, with a project called the Tall Trees. He's got instrumentation on 15 of the tallest trees on planet Earth. They're the uh, giant sequoias in, in the California redwoods, that sort of area. And uh, this instrument is 88 meters in the air. Now just imagine getting up there and doing that and you know, you don't want to drop anything and you certainly don't want to have this damn computer up there. But uh, here's the data and when I, George sent this to me last year and uh, look at the rehydration maxima here. It's a roughly one megapascal. It never gets higher, more hydrated than one megapascal. 88 meters should, by gravity alone, equal a water status of about 8.8, um, sorry, 0 .88 uh, megapascals, right, or 8.8 .8 bars, with one bar for every 10 meters. Hopefully this arithmetic isn't lost in you folks, you're all nodding vigorously, right? Okay. So it never actually gets any wetter than gravity will allow it. And uh, I was, I've never seen this sort of thing, I never climbed trees that high. So uh, this was, a, this was a, a very interesting revelation to me, and George has gone on to do much, much more with these uh, installations. He now wants way more technology than we can supply. And he also did a, um, early in my early days, the pressure bomb was my standard. How many of you used the pressure bomb in the field? I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> when you consider it, uh, I would say the only valuable number you can get from a pressure bomb that you can actually interpret reliably is pre-dawn. Once you get into the middle of the day, pick a number. And if you try and interpret any mechanisms under those conditions, the error bars are like this. Because the variability is naturally all over the bloody place in the plant. Uh, it, it does not. Plants redistribute water to the, along the path of least resistance. And when they get to stomatal thresholds uh, in various portions, they shut down. I've seen inversions in the me in the uh, water potential gradient in, in relatively tall trees, you know, sort of uh, 20, 30 meter trees. I've seen inversions from the top to the bottom because the stress level at the top dictates stomatal closure and rehydration and, and redistribution of water so that it rehydrates and you've got actually water moving from the top to the middle of the tree under certain conditions. And I suspect that that's a common occurrence in really arid, really hot, uh, high-stress regions. But here's the, uh, here's the pressure bomb, all these measurements, and here's a couple of psychrometers stuck to the same branch, just sitting on the bench in, uh, in George's lab. Now, if he'd had the foresight to weigh this thing as this was happening, he could have a pressure volume curve. And if you've ever done those with a pressure bomb, we also share some pain. I worked with Mel Tyree for a number of years and, and we did a lot of that stuff. Part of the stimulus behind inventing the stem psychrometer was to automate this kind of data acquisition because I'm as lazy as the day is long and automated data acquisition is me. Trust me. So th this was, uh, th this sort of convinced George and he went on uh, from there as, as it has others as well. So this is just a uh, an anecdotal application of, uh, of one of Alex's colleagues in Brazil? Costa Rica. Costa Rica. 
and uh, he he took delivery of, an, of a psychrometer installation and, and just stuck it on a potted coffee plant in the office or on, in nearby, and and watered it every day, as you can see. And then he went away for three weeks, and the cleaning lady came in once a week and watered it. <laughs> so, well, he left her instructions to water, but she only came in once a week. So, I mean, this is just that. Now you see these these positive numbers here. Um, they are theoretically impossible, of course. This, the psychrometric technique cannot measure a positive pressure. It's absolutely impossible. So what this actually means is that um, our friend in Costa Rica was using a default calibration protocol that's in the instrument, and I'm arguing with ICT to get that the heck out of there. Um, take because, well, I'm lazy. Uh, I'll, I'll call you folks uh, sort of susceptible to the same sin, and, uh, and if you see a default uh, scenario in there and you just want to test the instrument, you'll stick it on and, and, uh, and take what it gives you. Uh, but then you start to live with that and, uh, and you're too lazy to go and calibrate the thing. I'm, I'm arguing, um, you know, have the, f the first start card, the quick start card, calibrate the instrument <laughs> and then move on because this is a result of uh, using a default calibration. Uh, here's a, a really old study that's been published for, for many years now. But this was some work that I started doing with uh, the Heinz company, who do tomatoes, of course. And uh, they were interested in uh, mecha interpreting mechanisms of how uh, tomato fruit gain solids, dry matter, ketchup equals money. So uh, obviously everything that's in this terminal storage organ all the water, solutes, enzymes, whatever, come from this green factory. And the water status of the green factory is on a diurnal st stress and recovery cycle, just like all plants. Uh, the water status of the terminal storage organ, because it's covered with usually a waxy cuticle, is, is designed to be as stable as possible. It's, it's, as I said, a terminal storage organ, all the water, all the solutes, everything sort of piles up in here. And I argue that you could, you could apply this sort of uh, generic interpretation of fruits and, uh, in that context that as a terminal storage organ, they're designed to be relatively stable and their water status is dominated by the osmotic potential. And when, when fruits ripen, for example, uh, they do so with, or vine ripened, not ethylene gas ripened, but vine ripened fruit uh, are, are subject to the delivery of enzymes from the factory that split sugars and, uh, and, and do weird things to the osmotic potential very quickly. And those are the conditions under which, if there happens to be a little surplus of water available, and those enzymes start splitting sugars, and uh, one molal becomes two molal suddenly, um, then the fruit splits because of the osmotic potential. And that's a very common phenomenon among tomatoes, and, or sorry, tomatoes and, and other fruit. So, I'm looking at here the differential water status between the stem and the fruit. Now I hasten to add that uh, fruits, by their nature, don't like to have holes in them. So they callus over very quickly. The longevity of this installation is probably on the order of, well, less than a week. And you know, two, three days is, is really reliable. You can tell when it starts to lie to you because it all drifts to, uh, to either to zero or if it condenses or, or below. Uh, the stem is a little bit longer because it, it doesn't react with callus tissue as quickly, especially if you prepare it properly and get below the cuticle and get into a region of, of uh, the densest region of plant of water conducting tissue and away from cambium and stuff like that. So here is the fruit to stem water potential difference, and and here's the we also had linear displacement transducers on these fruit with with uh, stable uh, reference points. And, the, and the fruit, I would say fruit in general, how they grow is sort of three steps forward, one step back, three mm -hmm. steps forward, one step back. And they grow at night because the turgor pressure is the, is the medium that, that cell expansion and laying down new with the delivery of carbohydrates, etc. I'm not going to teach you anything new about that. But it's obvious here, here it is during the night and then during the day with the stress. So the, the fruit and stem, the stem is below the fruit. The fruit actually stays pretty stable. It changes seasonally. It starts out somewhere in the neighborhood of about a megapascal. 
and then it progressively over the season gets lower and lower and then when it ripens there's a bit of a, of a dip as enzymes are imported to split sugars and, and create the taste of tomatoes that I don't like actually. Uh, so uh, it, it's actually quite stable. It's just the stem which is subject to the diurnal pattern of conventional water relations stress and recovery, that sinus rhythm that all plants go through. When the stem falls below that of the fruit, then the fruit shrinks. And when it is above it, the fruit expands. And I've got tons of other data, and this is all published anyway, but tons of other data showing uh, we were differentiating these different cultivars of field processing tomatoes. and. Um, showed quite clearly that the mechanism of response to diurnal drought stress between these two cultivars was the mechanism that divided them in terms of their capacity to uh, accumulate solids equals ketchup. Here's the, uh, the cotton. This was a, uh, it was a hotter day than this. And uh, where was this? Uh, in New South Wales. In New South Wales. Which, yeah. Um, but we're, we're in a cotton field here, and uh, this is John, yeah, John Watson, the, uh, the cotton grower. And we, we attached a psychrometer to his plant, and uh, here, here's the installation. It's sometime in, in mid, yeah, about 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, it took about 90 minutes, which is a very typical equilibration time, roughly 90 minutes. And then uh, from then on, for the duration of the reliable installation, uh, you can you can rely on its on its output, but it takes about 90 minutes to equilibrate from essentially being handled. Temperature equilibrium is, is the main thing that has to dissipate because it's got a significant thermal mass. But then it, it went on overnight, and then right here it rained, started raining right about here, and and rehydrated to a higher level. It had been very dry prior to this, uh, and they'd been doing some irrigation also, but it rained and then uh, came out during the day and then we chopped it off here and took it home in the boot of the car. <coughs> and then you see this inflection point here. This we assume, again, with the no parametry data, there's tons of these little anecdotal experimental activities that, that we're doing as demonstrations uh, unfold far more questions than answers. But it's a, it's a minefield or, or potentially a gold mine depending on how you look at it, of, of uh, plant physiological and water relations studies. Um, so I, I'm fully expecting that someone here will go out and, and answer the question of what the heck is happening to the Kulaba tree at 5 o'clock in the morning when the sun hits it. Why is there no spike here in cotton? Uh, what do you mean spike? Well, you, talk, you just talked about the Kulaba spike at right. 5 a.m. I think it's unique to that to tree. Get? I think it's unique to that tree under those conditions. Uh, cotton. Well, we don't have a whole lot of experience with cotton, but it, and in any case, we only have one, one cycle here. We're only catching one morning. Uh, this is a relatively, I mean, it only was rehydrating to about five bars, minus five bars. And it was only when it got uh, 10 or 15 millimeters of rain uh, for an hour or so that morning that it, uh, that it actually rehydrated to a slightly higher level. And then it picked up again. But I, I have never seen that that spike in any other plant that I've ever looked at. So it's, it's, a, it's a particularly unique physiological response or plant environment interaction that must have to do, I'm guessing, with the threshold of uh, stomatal sensitivity to light in that species. And it takes advantage of the fact that it's in a, it's in a tough spot, hard to get water. Uh, if water is hard to get, then it must always guard it by closing its stomata, and then the result of that is no CO2. So it takes advantage of, I'm just guessing here, but this is a reasonably good uh, eco story of e ecological context, uh, that when it's at its highest level of hydration and it's, it's most, uh, you know, it's optimal grasp on managing stomatal function because it has, it, it has its highest level of turgor, uh, then it just takes a big drink of CO2, spends the water that it costs, and then recovers and uh, it can, it'll take a, probably a really big drink of CO2 because all of that intercellular CO2 has been consumed by photosynthetic chemistry the day before while it was stressed and the stomata were closed. So it's probably got a big CO2 gradient to pull CO2 in when it opens its stomata under those conditions. And 
uh, all of this can be confirmed, but it's, you know, it sort of sounds reasonable based on the kinds of work that we've done under many, many other different kinds of environmental conditions. Uh, this is the study we're doing at the moment in uh, southwest Ontario with a nursery, and here we've got uh, uh, an array of psychrometers on three different species. This is one of them. Now, you can't see it very well here, and this, this will ultimately be analyzed in the, uh, the daily integral as well. Because what we're looking for here, this is a, uh, a, an experiment where we're trying to establish the efficacy of a mycorrhizal fungi inoculation to the root zone. Uh, it's, it's a new product. Uh, it's under research registration at the moment and it is seeking to be registered commercially so that the nursery industry in Ontario can take advantage of a, of a commercial opportunity. And the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is, is administering um, the registration process and they have accepted the water potential, the water relations um, analysis of the response of these control and treated trees uh, as demonstrating efficacy. So in other words, it's eligible for their efficacy, uh, which is a big turnaround for them because usually food crops, you know, fertilizers, root applicants, all kinds of stuff you add to crops, the conventional efficacy demonstration is based on yield. And that's just the agronomic reality of, of, uh, of field crops. Uh, it, was, it was a great uh, revelation for them to see that you know real-time biophysical and plant physiological measurements of plant environment interaction could be demonstrated here and they have accepted the the psychrometry data as demonstrating efficacy and uh, and here these bars here that you can't really see very well uh, those uh, I, uh, identify regions of statistical significance in separating the two different species this particular one has some strange things going on after here, where where you think it, you know, it should be significantly different here in this hydration level. Indeed, it isn't, uh, and we think it's because there's there's quite a bit. Of, we have to look into the detail in the raw data, but uh, it's it's probably the variability on rehydration was more than the statistics could allow. And here's metasequoia. So Don redwood, which is a very common uh, ornamental nursery species and it's demonstrating the same efficacy on it. On and you notice this is a drought period, you see that, that, that uh, sort of typical continuous decline, um, lower recovery levels, uh, deeper drought stress levels daily. And this is uh, Eastern, or no, this is Black Sea, yeah, Thuya Nigra, um, where it's demonstrating again the progressive decline and the and even on the uh, overnight recovery, the the difference between them, their recovery level is significantly different. So these so days, yes, they're days. They're, they're sort of uh, uh, midnight-ish around here. Zero is midnight. So we're even showing, you know, progressively larger zone of significant difference between the treatments as the drought period uh, advances. And I think that gets me right to the end in time for uh, uh, so I, and, and this is Alex contact information if you don't already have it but uh, if I've stimulated any questions by all means have at it thank you Just on a practical one, you, you just mentioned statistics. Um, so, are these sorts of um, probes of such a nature that you can replicate as much as you want, and uh, or, is it, or does it get expensive? And stuff like that? Uh, well, just to put it into context, that experiment uh, was, in that case, 30 instruments fielded. Um, we're doing one this summer. We're we're going. We're going to be doing, I guess, nine species this summer in three lots, so we'll be fielding 36 instruments at a time. Um, I guess it's not prohibitive. It's uh, certainly more expensive than it was when I first started using these instruments because I was making them myself and everybody, everything was fine. But, um, I mean, in terms of, of numbers, that's, that's really Alex's game. And I'll, I'll refer you to him, but it's clearly you can't just use a couple of psychrometers. It's a waste of time. 
Uh, I would use a couple of psychrometers in a teaching exercise, in a demonstration exercise, undergraduate teaching lab, that sort of thing, doing pressure volume curves. So small numbers of instruments uh, have a value in a, in a small scale application or demonstration app, but, or teaching. I use them in teaching. We do pressure volume curves in cut roses, for example, in an in a afternoon um, undergraduate practical in a lab. And so we just stick the psychrometer on, throw it on a balance, and, uh, and, and collect the data. And then the exercise is, is analyzing the pressure volume curve and getting all of the relevant water relations information from it. So yes, it's quite valuable in that context. But in the field, uh, I, I would hesitate to do less than 10 or 12 instruments, and I'm not, I don't want to sell them, quite frankly. <laughs> but uh, um, because you do need that minimum number, and, and one of my research associates is calculating uh, the, the minimum number of instruments that we need to get you know, to achieve the level of, of significance that we're looking for, because it's very important in this case. Usually it isn't. Usually, uh, usually the answer is what the answer is, um, and, and you don't care so much. Uh, but in this case, the, the significant difference is, is a demonstration of efficacy. And if the efficacy is not demonstrated, no product registration. So it's clearly a much more different, higher pressure situation in this case. And uh, Tom is telling me that, uh, that he, he'd like to have at least eight instruments per treatment per species. Uh, so that, that's kind of, that's kind of uh, you know, tempering our aspirations for the scale <laughs> of field, field design. Uh, he, uh, the number he came up with first was 72. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> first of all, having done this sort of thing extensively in the field myself uh, years ago, uh, it, just physically maintaining and, and, and checking the data on 72 instruments is prohibitive. I, I, would, I would hesitate to do it. I understand George Koch is, is, is going to do the same thing. So these guys have uh, responded to that challenge and have got the, uh, the wireless uh, data acquisition system uh, coming on stream this year. So they are promising me wireless psychrometers in this field. So that means everything comes to one point. And uh, even better, if we manage to get the, uh, uh, the modem system working in our fields situation, then we can sit at home in the lab and pull the instruments in the field, um, or in the pub, and pull the instruments in the field from a single location. And that, obviously that's coming, and that's just a matter of, of technology that we have and uh, adapting it to this application. Yeah? Just a quick one just relating to the Victrix trials. Right. Alec might know more about this, but when, um, when you did the trial with the instruments, did you also use the um, score pressure bomb? I was just wondering if there was much difference. We, uh, we did have pressure bomb readings. Uh, unfortunately, this client beat us. We didn't put it up there. But there was, there was a general correlation between the pressure bomb and the, the psychrometer. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, was probably Andy. Can you remember off the top of your head, it was about anything up to about half a megapascal oh, difference yeah. at yeah. times. I'm glad you brought that up. Than that. I'm, I'm, you know, if, if you've got an inexhaustible supply of personnel resources in the field and, and dozens of uh, pressure bombs, you might catch this phenomenon, mm -hmm. but I doubt it. Mm -hmm. First of all, the variability that must be evident in this tree when this is happening, would obscure the mechanism once you take your triplicate samples and put the error bars on them. Uh, I mean, that's exactly how, how I struggled with the tomato data. Trying to differentiate the mechanisms of drought response in these two cultivars was impossible with a pressure bomb because the error bars obscured the mechanism. And uh, it's only when you have single point, non-destructive, continuous, measure, and this is a 10 minute temporal resolution, so, I mean, I've gone and done pre-dawn water potentials of the pressure bomb, and I didn't have a herd of, of, uh, of grunts helping me. So, you know, I, I get uh, my three, my triplicate sample here, and if I'm lucky, 
within an hour I've got another set, you know, you're waiting, you can't increase the pressure too fast or you blow past it. If there's uh, vesicles or air vesicles or something like that, then you get air bubbles. And you gotta discard that sample and get another one. And you're taking them from this tree that's, how many, how tall? You're using large clippers, right? You're not climbing up the tree to get examples, surely. And they're not readily available. But, but isn't the point, you're talking about the pressure chamber and these are complementary things. They're, they're not, they're, I think you've undersold the pressure chamber. And particularly for a whole bunch of students who can't afford uh, <laughs> 20, even 20 of these. Right. I, I should just say, you know, I, my career has been built around the pressure chamber. I'm a little biased. So is mine. <laughs> so is mine. But, I think the important thing is that they're complementary. And the point you make, there's, you're right, you'd never pick that up with anything that's not a continuous yeah. recording. On the other hand, you, you can take an awful lot of measurements, even if you don't have a, an hour, you can still take an awful lot of measurements. So you can bring that replica, the, the, the variation down in, in terms of analysis statistically. And so I think they're, they're quite complementary yeah, the, the temporal resolution is the issue, really. In the end, it's it's. I mean, you 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 literally can't achieve the level of temporal resolution, and 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 also the plant under these conditions. Any plant. I mean, this is a this is but, a but single the, point but measurement. This doesn't. You don't get around the issue of spatial variability. No, no, not at all. Not at all. What you get around is the issue of of uh, temporal or spatial variability confounding your interpretation of plant-environment interaction. This is a point on the plant. The whole plant is responding to the environment. And absolutely, the spatial variation is still there and there in spades. It's, if you had psychrometers all over this plant, you'd have a real puzzle of water. But it depends on the question you're asking. If you're asking, what is the spatial variation of water relations in this plant, then pressure bomb or multiples of these will give you that answer. Um, I, I stopped asking that kind of question about 20 years ago, and now I'm more interested in plant environment interaction. I want to know what is the soil moisture or the vapor pressure deficit or the solar radiation doing to the environmental experience of this plant. And I'm arguing that a single point measurement is just as powerful as triplicate pressure bomb measurements in terms of, and, and more so in that you have the temporal um, reliability, the temporal sort of, you know, a 10 minute temporal resolution is, is uh, outrageous in, in any other context. So continuous measurements and same with sap flow and, and, and there's a few other techniques that have, have popped in and out of the, off the landscape like pressure probes and things like that that, that allow you single point continuous measurements uh, of, of a some physical, uh, biophysical or biochemical response of the plant to environmental conditions. So, yeah. Um, we've played, well not me personally, but we've played around a little bit at CSR over these instruments on eucalypts. And strikes, so what we've found basically is that they're quite difficult to install correctly. And so you may get a, a damaged installation while it's very installed in the stage. Um, and so that begs the question, is this just an artifact of this installation or is it a real effect? And have you seen this on other trees in the area? Not to get too carried away. I have no idea. That's the that will be the, the data acquisition that come, happens later this week, I fear. Just, just on that point, we, we did actually install on five different trees uh, within the, the general area of, of this one tree. And all five of them demonstrated that same response. So there's effectively five independent trees telling the same line. Fine, that answers the question. And just to follow on from that, um, how long did it take you to install 30 of these instruments in your A morning. A morning. And don't get me wrong, if this was easy, anybody could do it. <laughs> so, yes, there are occasions where you have to hold your head just so. To, uh, to understand what the heck's going on with the instrument. And it has, it has uh, as many sources of error as, as many other techniques. Uh, I think in, in large, the, uh, when the instrument is lying to you, you can usually tell. Uh, if one of, the, one of the nemesis of this whole system is condensation inside the chamber. And when condensation occurs, 
uh, the instrument is definitely lying to you. It simply goes to zero and stays there. But at least it's telling you that it's lying to you. Uh, we've, we've got um, a heater built into the thing that mitigates that and we're working out. There are all kinds of uh, systematic protocols that you can apply to mitigate condensation issues. And you, know, you can get really sophisticated and, and say whenever the temperature gradient starts to drift in the direction that favors condensation under certain conditions, then you initiate a heating protocol. It turns out that really all you have to do is heat the darn thing for a couple of minutes well before the next instrument uh, the next uh, reading so that the because you initiate a huge delta T in there you have to wait for it to ring down before you can make a reliable measurement uh, and, and the, the ring down we've analyzed that under lots of different conditions so this is all being integrated into ICT's firmware to uh, uh, to mitigate that as much as possible yeah um, so you mentioned that offense like positive um, so we can if it wasn't calibrated, yeah. So we um, played around with a few as well. We had four around the stem, and we did the calibration, uh, and we got two or three days worth of data out of it. But on the fourth day, the midday, we ran about top zero. Then it it condensed. You reckon it's condensation? Absolutely. If at midday it's bouncing up to zero, then you have condensation. Yeah. So you can convert. Zero, you get positive values, not up to zero. Yeah. yeah well, you, when we'll see the the um, the reliability of the measurement is much much greater the drier it is. So the the uh, I, I guess the error, if you will. But as it gets wetter and wetter, the the, the variability down at the sort of one two three bar range, it, it's least reliable then because the the vapor pressure deficit driving evaporation in the chamber is, is lowest and susceptible to uh, to potential temperature gradients and those sorts of things. So it, 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 you would expect to be Sorry? At midday you would expect to be fine Absolutely. But if it if it condensation has occurred, then what happens is uh, let's just get a picture here. What happens when condensation occurs? is you get free water adhering to the walls of the chamber. And once free water is adhering to the wall of the chamber and not connected to the plant tissue that's you know, absorbing and desorbing, then it's really difficult. You have to drive that free water back into vapor phase and allow it to come back into equilibrium with the water phase in the plant conducting tissue. And that's really, really hard to do. Well, again, wouldn't you expect condensation to happen in the morning or in the night and not in the day when it's very warm? It, there's also exudation from the plant. You can get uh, and resinous species. Uh, we, work, we work with a, a Captain Cook plant that has a resin in it, and you've got to dodge those little white pustules rather carefully, because if one of them happens to be in the chamber, then uh, it very quickly goes to zero and it's all over. So it, it, you can get exudation. Some eucalypts, uh, as we've seen, can provide that. So, okay, it, it's not a panacea, nothing is. There's no silver bullet here. Uh, there are conditions under which you do have to be careful. You, we overcame the resin issue with the Captain Cook, which I thought was remarkable. And I ju usually just X out resinous species uh, as a matter of course, but you can actually get around it. But once again, it's not going to be, uh, I mean, this is field work. Whenever something, can go wrong. <laughs> Murphy's law applies in the field. Anybody who's done field work knows exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, we've done as much as we can in my research program over the last number of decades to mitigate as many of the head holding issues as you possibly can. Uh, you're never going to get them all, but you can actually overcome uh, quite a few to the point where you end up with data that you can interpret. And that's, you know, reliable data is what you're all after. There's, there's, another, there's another issue that I'd like to ask if it's possible to overcome um, the central thermal coupling. I mean, both thermal couples are quite fragile, right? Yeah. So if you put the chamber on the, on the sample, and uh, you've got that nice demonstration video on the ICT web page, and you don't get a seal with the surface, then you have to spray the lid again and reapply it. But each time you put it on, so I, I compared the, the, the sample thermal couple before, and so I made sure it looked above the surface. Right. But if you put it on, you immediately kind of push it in again. 
It's a bit spring-loaded. It, it doesn't, I mean... Yeah, that's, that, that was my question, what I was, was referring to. Isn't it possible to, to do it, to construct it really spring-loaded? Like, for instance, a drum couple in the Lycor chamber head? Have the one in the Lycor is um, a 48-gauge thermocouple. This is a 25 micron. I know, I know. And, and it, it necessarily has to be, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, There's no way to stabilize Well, the other thing is you can't weld a 48 gauge thermocouple. It's, it's too conductive, so it won't short circuit and weld the way the 25 micron one will. Uh, it, it's a very, I agree with you, if there was an easier way, I'd love to find it. And we'll, we'll probably sample, you know, we, we could probably make the S thermocouple a little more robust, but it would not be a welded thermocouple. So it would have different characteristics, different uh, electrical characteristics, and it would require probably a, a calibration protocol to when you measure the delta T. Yeah. I, I don't think you can apply 61 microvolts per degree as a conventional chromal constant. So it would require it would re require some uh, some calibration, and, and now you've just made more work for me. So I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs>